So in this broadcast, we're looking at restoration ecology, and our learning target is to show ways that we can help nature heal. First, what is ecological restoration? Well, in a nutshell, it is an attempt to repair human-caused damage to an ecosystem. For example, uh, if a habitat could be destroyed by building a farm, if you cut down a forest to build a farm, or you or a factory or a paper mill dumps waste into a river or a watershed is a watershed is an area is a large area that drains water into a river like like the Mississippi watershed actually covers most of the United States and it's all water which falls into the, all the groundwater, all the streams in that Mississippi watershed flow flow into the Mississippi River. So nothing waste into that watershed can cool the water and can damage the ecosystem in the streets. Also draining the wetland is an example of human caused damage. All these two examples all these two examples occurred in New York City. And these are definitely not the only types of examples. Before we move on, let's go to some vocabulary. Uh, there's restoration, the the strict sense of restoration is returning the community to the way that it was originally before the damage. But in a broad sense restoration is Reversing the degradation and reestablishing some aspects of the previous ecosystem. So it's not going back exactly to the way it was, but it's as close as we can get it. Then there's rehabilitation, and for this, a community is rebuilt to useful functioning state, but it's not necessarily its original condition. Intervention is applying a technique to discourage or reduce unwanted species and to encourage wanted species. And reallocation is creating, and reallocation is creating a different community on the site. Rather than remediation is chemically cleaning an area using mild or non-destructive methods. Reclamation is chemically and physically cleaning uh, and repairing a severely degraded or barren site. So the difference between the two is remediation is used at a site that's not severely degraded and using milder methods than reclamation for an area that is very, very severely degraded. And then recreation is making a new ecosystem on a severely degraded site. Climate mitigation is replacing a degraded site with another site or sites of equal or more ecological value at another place. Now frequently on the EP exam you need to know some important early conservation effects. Like when we talked about in the past was Rachel Carson. There are two more. There's Gifford Pinchot. He was the first chief of the US Forest Service and he introduced sustaining harvesting trees in national forests. Rather than clear cutting, the loggers should go in and selectively cut the trees. And another thing that and another thing that uh, Gifford Pinchot started, which is something that was stopped uh, back about 20 years ago when it was after the firestorm, he started he made the he started the policy of the Forest Service suppressing all forest fires, and that basically helped preserve the trees that were there. But on the other hand, it led to the huge fire storm that had later on in the, 19, in the late 1980s in Yellowstone because fires are a natural part of the ecosystem in some forests. And, Aldo, and with Aldo Leopold, he changed the concept of wilderness from a place for hunting and recreation into an area for a healthy biotic community. And he also changed wildlife management from protecting game species, that those are species for hunting, into retaining and destroying biodiversity. These are the general principles for ecological restoration. One is to remove the physical stressors, you need to remove the thing that is actually disturbing the environment. Like if a paper mill is is putting wastes and dyes into into a stream, then you need to stop that from happening. Also, control invasive species. So, the invasive species are often the native ones. You need to remove those invasive species as much as you can. And then you plant the native plant species to help establish the community. And similarly, on the fauna side, you can use active breeding and other methods to reestablish native animals. During all of this and afterwards, to monitor the ecosystem to see if these methods are working and if things need to be changed. Now I'm going to look at, an, at one example of restoration, and that is in the Bronx River. There are other examples that you are definitely responsible for that are listed in the textbook. I'm not 
and I'm not going to go over it, and you will also have to do a project looking at another example of restoration. If you had sailed up the Bronx River in 1609, you would have seen huge thick forests, ancient forests, with huge American chestnut trees and tulip trees, all kinds of fish in the river, huge shellfish at the mouth of the river, you know, big, big oysters and clams. The Bronx River is a river that has a long history of degradation and pollution, and physical changes, and changes to the natural environment, to the animals and the plants that live around the river. And there's efforts now underfoot that'll probably take hundreds of years to fully implement, to try and reconstruct and rebuild the river from sort of the bottom up. One of the things that we do out here on the Bronx River is bank stabilization. And erosion control. We do some invasive removal. And we help bring back and restore habitat. When we're talking about restoration, um, what we have in mind is a picture from the past. And we are trying to bring the river back to that loop or that stage. One of the ways we can do that is by looking at historical maps like some of the ones I have here. So this map for example, is from the American Revolution. There's a little note here that the infantry could cross here at low tide. Here's the Bronx River coming down here. These are all extensive salt marshes, nurseries for fishes, and things that protect us from floods and so forth. This is a map from 1851. This is more about real estate. You know, here's where O. Paisley lived and W. Watson. And then it shows what we're interested in, which is the Bronx River. Once we find the historical maps in a map archive or a library, we scan them and we take it into the computer and we do a process called georeferencing. So we try and fit the map to a set of coordinates like latitude, longitude or something like that. One place that restoration is occurring on the Bronx River is the Concrete Plant Park. It's a former concrete factory. So here we have the Bronx and uh, have these aerial photos turned on. That is the Concrete Plant Park this white bit alongside the Bronx River. And if we zoom in, here's the subway coming across on the top of Westchester Avenue. And this green fringe here, that's actually a salt marsh restoration and, and bank development project. And if I turn on the historical reconstruction, you can see this all once upon a time was salt marsh, way back here, way up past the subway station. And this is forest up here and across the way was another big stand of forest and the salt marsh is nearly far as you can see. So we use all this kind of information to reconstruct the past environment. We take into account the physical landscape, the topography and water courses, and then fill in the biological parts, what the ecosystems were and then what the species that were living in those ecosystems were. By looking at these maps and looking at these reconstructions we've done on the computer, it gives people an idea of what actually might be possible. We're working on a shellfish restoration project. There are live oysters that live within this estuary environment, and we're trying to offer them more habitat um, to grow on. So we're just placing out some habitat structures today, clamshell wrapped in plastic mesh bags, and we're hoping that we see the oysters that are actually in this water land on our mesh bags and start to grow. Oysters were historically an important part of New York City's environment. They helped to filter out pollutants from our water, um, and they also form a reef environment which creates spaces that uh, fish species can use, crabs will use for protection, snails. Um, so not just the oysters are offered protection by a reef, but many other creatures. Uh, so it's a very important habitat that we're looking to see if we can kind of uh, increase again in New York City's waters. All right, is everybody ready? Because when this happens, it's going to happen fast. It's going to be pretty much over in about 20 seconds. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, here we go. Go, Dave. Here we go. Sorry, right 
It's unlikely that we'll ever be able to restore the numbers of alewives to the Bronx River that historically occurred. But probably what's more important than restoring the n numbers of alewives is just having the species here to fill that role they had in the ecosystem. They are the real foundation of the food web. They're feeding birds and raccoons and river otter. So we're not just restoring the alewives for the sake of alewives, we're restoring the alewives for the sake of the entire ecosystem. When we try and restore an ecosystem, or a river in this case, we're trying to restore it so that it works for as much of nature as possible. I mean, so it works for the wildlife, things in the river, plants and animals, and for people. And it's not like you snap your fingers and poof, you know, salt marsh come back to the river. You know, it's a lot of hard work, you know, planting one plant at a time, little tiny restoration efforts, small victories, you know, that eventually we'll build up, we'll connect with each other and, and rebuild a river that, that we can all enjoy and appreciate. The health of the river is getting better. We've been monitoring the river and the results are getting better and better. I've been here for three years, but we have people from the community that have been here for over 20 years. And it counts more when the people from the community, they come up to you and they even tell you the change. Wow, this have never looked like this before. I mean, there used to be cars in here, motorcycles, and now they're seeing fish, they're seeing muskrats, they're seeing birds, they're seeing families of ducks. I want everyone to utilize this river. This is wonderful. So what was done with the Bronx River? 400 years ago, we had a pristine ecosystem, and this was steadily disturbed, chron it was chronically disturbed by, by, by different factories and just German people in the Bronx. So we ended up with a degraded ecosystem. But it didn't go as far as going through the threshold of irreversibility to a barren site. So we went as far as the degraded ecosystem, and what we were seeing in the video was that there was some intervention and we saw them reintroducing plants, we saw them reintroducing fish, we saw them getting rid of the uh, species. So the intervention and there was a through the rehabilitation through this loop that we see over here. It was the ultimate steady space. And uh, we saw they were trying to bring it as close to pristine ecosystem as possible, but they admitted that it kept getting it all the way to, to the pristine ecosystem that is probably not going to happen. So it goes as far as the ultimate steady space. Now we come to the concluding questions. Number one, define ecological restoration. Number two, what is the difference between reclamation and remediation? Number three, what was Aldo Leopold's contribution? Number four, list the general principles of restoration projects. That concludes this podcast and I'll see you in class tomorrow.